So we go from tax law and from Brexit negotiations to a rather more tantalizing and salacious title for our talk today, which is Homosexuality, Pedophilia and Government Suppression of a Scandal. A headline that I'm sure will cause a second glance even for those who skim read our notices. And it surely piqued the attention of many of you, um, many of our members, because we do indeed have a full house today. So let me set the scene before we introduce our speaker. The story is this. In 1980, Inspector John McLennan was found on the floor of his locked flat. He had been shot five times in the chest. The police who arrived on the scene and saw his body and the suicide note assumed that he had taken his own life. Others were suspicious and cried foul play, and so therefore there was a year-long public inquiry into the incident, and lots of witnesses were called from all sections of life in Hong Kong. Nigel Collett, our speaker today, is a Hong Kong businessman. He served for 20 years in the British Army before retiring as Lieutenant Colonel, and since then has been Managing Director of Gurkha International, which has two companies that uh, find employment for men and women from Nepal on cruise lines and also in security. Nigel's new book, A Death in Hong Kong, which we literally just received about 10 minutes ago, hot off the press, um, is uh, what he's going to talk about today because, of course, this story didn't just end with the death of Inspector John McLennan. There were an awful lot of other things that people found out as they investigated this case. So Nigel, who's also in his spare time a historical biographer, um, is going to tell us what he's found out as he has been um, looking again into this very interesting case that we had in the early 80s in Hong Kong. Nigel. Elaine, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very grateful to the FCC for the chance to talk to you all, uh, and before such a, a large and distinguished audience, uh, about my new book on the subject of the McClellan case of 1980. Uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking at the club uh, only once before, in 2004, and on that occasion, the subject was my book, The Butcher of Amritsar, uh, which was about India in 1919. And that resulted in my becoming a member of the club. Uh, I'm hoping that my talk today uh, will not appall you up so much that uh, I have to reverse that process. <laughs> the McLennan case was a very complicated one, uh, and I have only 20 minutes to discuss it. So I will concentrate on a few of the key issues to which it gives rise. First, let me give an outline of the events in the case. On the morning of 15th of January 1980, as Elaine has indicated now, 29-year-old Scottish Inspector John McLennan, who was about to be arrested for eight counts of gross indecency with male prostitutes, was found dead in his quarters in Homan Tin. He had four bullet holes around his heart and one in his abdomen. A police revolver, which he had himself drawn from the armory that morning, was by his body. A suicide note was on his desk, and he was inside two locked doors, the outside door to his flat, and his internal bedroom door. There was no sign of a struggle or of anyone else in the room. Access to the flat, other than through the doors, was not impossible, but very difficult. Suicide was assumed. The intended prosecution of McLennan had come about because the Police Special Investigation Unit, the SIU, had been ordered to find information on him that would enable the police to remove him from the force. While serving in New and Long in 1978, McLennan had survived an earlier attempt to remove him. He had survived in part thanks to the involvement of Elsie Elliott, who later became Elsie II, who had brought the governor, Sir Mary McLehose, to stop his dismissal. This had not been forgotten or forgiven in the senior echelons of the police force, and these had sought to use the SIU to dispose of him. After the death, public disquiet arose due to three factors. Firstly, a disbelief, uh, which many of us still hold, 
that a man could fire five single shots into himself. Secondly, the fact that there was information, for instance, in the hands of Elsie Elliott, that the SIU, in trying to build a case against McLennan, had gone so far the previous year as to suggest to their informer, Police Inspector Mike Fulton, that he set up McLennan with a homosexual lure. And thirdly, information in similar hands that McLennan had alleged that he had seen the name of the Commissioner of Police, Roy Henry, on a special branch list of suspected homosexuals. This all led to an open verdict at the inquest. Subsequent calls for an inquiry, both in Hong Kong and the UK, forced the government's hand and Justice T.L. Yang was appointed to head a commission in July of 1980. The commission sat for over seven months. Eventually, Yang reported that McLennan had indeed committed suicide, but Yang was so muted in his criticisms of the illegalities and the ill motivation that he had found in the inquiry that no policeman or official was punished for any part in the case. McLennan was bisexual and not a paedophile, but he was a casualty in a phony war being conducted by the SIU on the part of the Hong Kong government, a war supposedly being waged against named paedophiles and homosexuals in the Hong Kong establishment, but which was actually a smokescreen for hiding the scandal of their activities. The SIU had been set up in 1978 after the arrest of a lawyer and businessman named John Richard Duffy, who had been supplying teenage boys to contacts, contacts which included Sir Geoffrey Briggs, the then Chief Justice of Hong Kong. Duffy had given the police evidence of a large number of homosexuals, some of whom were involved in procuring youths, or in some cases children, from Hong Kong schools and other sources. At the time, homosexual acts were illegal in Hong Kong and were to remain so until 1991. And there was little distinction in 1980 made at the time between men who abused children and youths and homosexual men with partners over any age of consent. The word paedophilia was not current and was not used in this case. The information Duffy gave can only now be pieced together in part, and there is no hard substantiating evidence to back it up. All that is possible nowadays is to find anecdotal evidence for or against his allegations. I managed to find enough to indicate to my mind that at least 50% of the names he gave were indeed those of homosexuals and possibly were paedophiles. There are four sources for sets of lists of these accused, all drawn from documents in LC2's deposits in the Hong Kong Baptist University Library or from the inquiry transcript. In my book and in this talk, I do not name the names listed, save for those of officials whose names cause particular concern to the government and which are in the public record already as having been subject to accusations. I would stress that none of them have been convicted or proved to be guilty of the things that Duffy said of them. The first of these four lists was accumulated by the New Territories CID during the course of their investigations of Duffy. They themselves told Duffy at his arrest that they had a list of named suspects that included a superintendent and three inspectors of the RHKP, one of whom was the prosecutor at North Kowloon Magistracy and was known to go about in drag. Three members of the judiciary, including the Chief Justice, Sir Geoffrey Briggs, an administrative officer of the Hong Kong Civil Service, who preferred boys aged 12 to 14, and a lawyer employed by the legal department who had been accused and had confessed two years before, but had not been charged, his crime being that of having had sex with several, several boys aged under 14 from the Kowloon New Method School. This list did not include John McLennan's name. Duffy gave the police a long list of names after his arrest in 1978, which included an ex-police officer procurer of teenage boys named Merlo Choi, whose customers, Duffy alleged, included the editor of the Star newspaper, a paper in which Choi had advertised his services as the Boy Services Sunny Bathhouse. Also, Kazi Chow, a close friend of Sir Geoffrey Briggs, who was the intermediary between the Chief Justice and the procurer Merlo Choi, the then Commissioner of Police, Brian Slevin, Chief Superintendent Ron Redpath of the Police Public Relations Branch, and 12 other named police officers. 
Duffy also gave details to the police of a European who kept a yacht at the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club in Causeway Bay and lived in a cul-de-sac next to the playground of the Hong Kong Sea School at Stanley with the two Europeans who owned the cage disco. These, Duffy stated, procured boys from the school and passed them around, around, passed them around a group of friends. These friends, according to Duffy, included a senior executive of the Hong Kong and Shanghai hotels who lived in the Repulse Bay Hotel, a textbook publisher, formerly of Longman's, rumored to be a member of MI6, a lawyer who had become a businessman in a trading company, a prominent doctor and member of the BMA, a well-known TV personality and some other TV people, and a businessman of a property and printing group based in Duddle Street. Duffy added another list when he appealed against his sentence in 1979. The names of those he accused this time included Sir Dennis Roberts, by then the Chief Justice of Hong Kong, the then Commissioner of Police, Roy Henry, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Neil McDougall, and the head of another Hong Kong discipline service. He added the names of more police officers, including a group of inspectors, some of whom he alleged took prostitutes from the cage disco in Kowloon back to their government quarters in Wong Tai Sin, and a couple of officers who gave transvestite parties and showed blue gay movies to a large number of young boys in their flat in Grand Court, Kadori Avenue. Duffy did not at any stage list McLennan's name. Finally, the fourth source was SIU and SB kept records, some of which were revealed at the inquiry by its counsel, John Beveridge. There is no record of the names of these men. The SIU list included a transvestite policeman, a senior officer who was promiscuous and used to procure a regular to obtain young boys, and an officer of medium to senior rank whose sporting association gave him charge of young boys and who had been found in bed with some of them by his armor. They had the name of three police officers living in the same service as John McLennan with their boyfriends. The special branch had 35 names in their records and Beveridge revealed at the inquiry that no action had been taken against any of these. Although Commissioner Henry had initialed them all, some entries said confirmed, some indicated admission. One named the police informer, Inspector Michael Fulton, another was for another inspector known to the inquiry and yet another was for the manager of a football team of little boys, presumably the officer listed in the SIU. John McLennan's name was not included in any special branch list and was only on the SIU list because the SIU had been ordered to put it there by Assistant Commissioner of Personnel and Training, Eric Blackburn. That there was, to be a rec that, sorry, that there was recognized to be a severe problem with all this is shown by the fact that the, I the SIU was established to investigate in reaction to the first of Duffy's lists and was enlarged, revived, revived, and formally tasked in reaction to the second. There is no record of the SIU investigating any of the men on these lists, and instead they were forced, either by unrecorded order or by their own sense of self-preservation, to focus on small fry, men who were offered up to justice to show that something was being done, but whose cases would not embarrass the establishment. These men were chosen to give a balance of victims shared equally between civil service, police, the legal department, and civilian world. These were largely men in police sites for other reasons, as was John McLennan. Before John McLennan's death, those prosecuted included only Gordon Huttart, the proprietor of Disco Disco with his bouncer, the procurer Molo Choi, but not Sir Geoffrey Briggs associate Kazi Chow, who turned Queen's evidence, a low-level civil servant named Colin Logan, and a lawyer of the legal department named Howard Lindsay. This situation continued after McLennan's death. There is no record that further investigation into the four lists was carried out. The effect of all this on the gay community was severe. The tolerant modus vivendi that had been reached prior to 1978, which had allowed gay men considerable freedom of action, evaporated. Some junior police officers who were gay lost their jobs. Gay social life closed down, and the clubs like Dateline and Disco Disco withered on the vine. An atmosphere of fear blanketed the gay community for the rest of the decade. However, in the longer term, the importance of the case to history and the present day is that it was the spur to the government's instruction to the Law Reform Commission to examine the law in Hong Kong on homosexuality. And this led to their 1983 report advocating the decriminalization of homosexual acts in private between those aged over 21, 
a recommendation the government finally made in a white paper in 1989 and which was enacted in 1991. I will close with a few remarks about what the case reveals about colonial government in Hong Kong, apart from the very successful cover-up of the scandal in 1980. The McLennan case occurred towards the end of the process by which Governor Sir Murray McLehose and the ICAC cleaned up the police and other parts of society. But it indicates that there was no clean end to corruption after the police mutiny of 1977. Those senior officers who were long-term Hong Kong hands, and that was most of those who handled the McLennan case, had all survived the amnesty of that year. They were men who had, in the words of Judge Sir Alastair Blair Kerr and reporter Kevin Sinclair, either got on the bus of corruption or had stood aside to watch it go by. They were not men who had stood in its way to oppose corruption, and so their actions during the course of the case harked back to the old ways of doing things, ways to which Commissioner Roy Henry had finally put paid by his retirement in 1985. Lies, intimidation, violence, and tampering with evidence all occurred frequently during the McLennan case. Similarly, the corruption in the legal department and judiciary that had clearly gone in hand in hand with that in the police had hardly been touched by 1980 and would only become evident later in cases such as Carrion and the Warwick Reed cases. Chief Justice Sir Dennis Roberts' dubious part in both the McLennan case and the Carrion case is another indication of the way that the bad old days lingered into the middle 1980s. Finally, the case last casts light on the old British habit of appointing a commission of inquiry with the aim not so much as to uncover the truth of an issue, but rather to provide the public an explanation of an issue in order to bury it. The McLennan inquiry was set up to deflect public anger and to ensure that detail of the Duffy allegations never saw the light of day. It was initially staffed with figures whom the governor felt would manage it in this interest. To the governor's consternation, then fury, the commissioner, Justice Yang, and his counsel, John Beveridge, did not prove to be men who would do this. As a result, the governor sought ultimately to rein in the commission he had established by curtailing its length, by putting its sittings into camera, and by forcing the commissioner to adopt a more restrictive view of his terms of reference. It may surprise many to learn that I believe that Justice Yang su successfully resisted the governor's attempts to hobble what he was doing. But there was a price that he had to pay for this, and I believe that this was the production of an inquiry report that while it showed the wrong that had been done to McLennan and the illegal way in which parts of the investigation had been conducted, made such faint criticism that no one had to be dismissed or punished for any part they had played in the case. I will end with a few remarks about the role of members of this club in the, in the case. I would not have written this account had it not been for Aileen and Ken Bridgewater, who persuaded me that a non-fiction account needed to be written. Ken, as you probably know, published Open Verdict, his novel on the subject, a couple of years ago. Through her work in commercial radio, Aileen had accumulated a huge amount of information and documentation on the case, and they loaned me all of it. She introduced me to the redoubtable Elsie too, who also persuaded me that this story should be told. I am only sorry that neither of them long, lived long enough for their wished-for account to be published and that they will not be able to see it now. Part of the documents loaned me by Aileen were six huge scrapbooks of press cuttings about the case, and I have based much of my book upon them. These make it absolutely clear that without the factual reporting in 1980 and the growing editorial calls for government action, calls made by the South China Morning Post, the Hong Kong Standard, the Sun and the Star, there never would have been an inquiry at all. The excellence of reporting by figures such as Dave Hadfield and Roy Edmonds of The Post, Lionel Rodriguez, Tim Steed, Neil Hamble, and Tim Hamlet of The Standard, and Dave Malcolm and Trevor Wyatt of The Star, makes it possible now to follow and unravel this very complicated case. Without their and their unnamed colleagues' exact reporting of the testimony given at the inquiry, we would not now be able to reassemble the course of events for the Hong Kong government has refused to release the transcript of the inquiry, and only its key elements are held in Hong Kong University Library. I would even here make mention of the late Kevin Sinclair, friend and often mouthpiece of the police as he was, his occasional reporting of the case was revelatory of the police and official mind. 
historians should be grateful to the media of the day. I fear that those studying future cases may not be so lucky. Thank you very much, Nigel. It's good to know that the press were really doing their, their, their part, playing their part in those days. Um, murky stuff. I'm sure there are lots of questions. If anyone would like to ask a question, if you could raise your hands and state who you are and which organisation you are with, please. Yes, please. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Vodin, England. I wasn't quite on the standard in time to cover it, but to cover the Law Reform Commission efforts in 83. So um, my question is, why were they after him already two years earlier in Yun Long? Um, you said they wanted, they were, they had some reason to get him anyway, and they were using this as a way to do it. So did I miss that? What no, was you didn't. I didn't have time to speak of that. So it's a good question. Um, there are two possible reasons why they wanted him out of the force from the Yuan Long days. Um, John McLennan started to take uh, male prostitutes back to his quarter uh, in around about the time he was posted there, uh, 77, 78. And it seems that that became known. Uh, and uh, reports were made, but nothing was done about it. And there is an, also another alternative explanation um, that uh, he was um, receiving packets of pay of, of money on his desk from the station sergeant, as had been done in many of the divisions of the police force, uh, and had been stamped on um, in earlier times. It would appear that in New and Long it was still going on in 77, 78. And he took these down to the um, the ICAC office in Sham Shui Po and handed them in. Uh, and I would probably guess that that was known within the police station that, that something was going on like this. So he was hooked with a young man in a restaurant in New and Long uh, in 78. Um, and I think it is quite likely that he accepted the hook. So he had made himself um, vulnerable to what happened afterwards. Um, but the young man was brought to his table and introduced as a young man who wanted to join the police force, Chinese boy, basically, a student. Um, and John McLennan was supposed to have taken him back to his room and, and made advances to him. Exactly what happened was never been made clear. Um, he was, um, this was reported, uh, uh, the police investigated it. And at that point, um, Roy Henry was acting commissioner of police. And the, um, the assistant commissioner in the New Territories demanded that McLennan be fired, dismissed and got out of his district. And Roy Henry sacked him at a month's notice with no explanation, no redress, no attempt to appeal. And that was the beginning of the case. Um, John McLennan then was introduced by the magistrates for whom he worked at Fan Ling to Elsie Elliott, which seemed to him a godsend, but sadly was the reverse. Because Elsie, in her fiery way, got into the governor's office, wrote letters to the governor, and the governor asked why has he been fired without any um, cause and with no um, attempt to give uh, appeal. Uh, and the whole thing was stopped. So the police then believed, I think, that um, John McLennan had used the governor to get reinstated. And he was therefore on their black books. So when the SIU was formed, a little later, um, for totally different reasons, there to those who wanted to get rid of John McLennan uh, was a means of doing so. Thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman on table two. Thank you. Uh, David Hodson, uh, a club member and a retired police officer. Um, I would like to say that I do not take exception to anything you've said. Um, it seems to me to be an accurate and balanced account of events. So uh, th there are a couple of aspects that, that people tend to get confused about and, and are not the issue. Um, I was involved on the fringes of the investigation at the time I was in charge of the Interpol Bureau, and I tracked down the professor uh, at Oslo University who seemed to be the world authority on multiple shot suicides. Um, there aren't many experts because there aren't many multiple shot suicides, but they're not all that uncommon, in fact. Most people, and myself included, thought, hey, no way, Jose. Um, it doesn't happen. Well, it does, uh, and they're relatively uncommon. The second point that relates directly to McLennan's, John McLennan's death is that there was yet another cock-up. The protocol at the time in the police was that if a police officer was to be arrested, 
his boss was told a day or so before, and arrangements were made for him to be being interviewed um, so that he could be arrested in safe circumstances. Arresting a police officer who has access to a firearm, who is surrounded by colleagues who have firearms, uh, can be uh, hazardous, should I say, if it goes wrong. Unfortunately, the boss at the time breached protocol and told McLennan a day or so before that he was going to be arrested. So, you know, bearing in mind the circumstances and the pressures he was under, it's not really surprising he just went down to the armory, got a gun and shot himself. That's not the issue. The issue is all the matters that you have dealt with about the exploitation of young boys, the blackmail, the scandal. That's where the story is, and you're quite right to focus on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Actually, can I just pick up on something? Because prior to lunch, we were talking about the firearms that the police had in those days. And would you like to just share a little bit about what you know about that um, in terms of could he have shot himself five times? I, I should say, first of all, thank you for that. And I wish I'd met you before I read the book. That would have been very <laughs> good, good to, to be able to talk. Um, I was told by many of the police officers who served at the time um, the one explanation for the, the, the possibility that a man could fire five times into his own body without causing a recoil from the revolver that would take it away from the target and would not push himself back because of the recoil from the hitting of the round was that the rounds and the, um, the weapon were very underpowered, deliberately underpowered because they um, were meant not to hurt people on the street, but also because they were very old very badly maintained, and the Hong Kong government, very mean with money, uh, had not um, replaced weapons and had not um, updated the ammunition. I, I was told stories by ex-policemen of um, real occasions when a revolver would be fired and the bullet would come out of the barrel and would actually fall on the floor in front of it. <laughs> um, I, um, more like a cartoon. So in that case, and it was, it was, rather, it was proven later on, and um, there was an occasion when the, the firearms expert and some of the staff from the commission um, in front of the press, fired that revolver into a block of gelatine hanging from a wire. Uh, the wire and the gelatine hardly moved, uh, and there was no recoil on the revolver. Um, so that particular weapon, uh, I think, would have made it uh, easier for him to kill himself in that fashion. We have a question in... A very, very quick follow-up, just very, very quick. Thanks. Yeah, on that point. Just a quick one on, on the matter of uh, police ammunition. It's much worse than you're suggesting, uh, simply because uh, a police officer draws his weapon and loads it in the morning. He has to then unload it when he goes for lunch, reload it after lunch, and uh, hand it in in the evening. So you can imagine these rounds are going in and out. Every time the guy in charge of the armory goes out of the armory, he has to hand over to somebody else. So somebody has to check. So it was the same small amount of ammunition that was going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And so quite often the ends would fall out of the bullets. They was, it wasn't until later that they... This is all very reassuring to know. Thank you very much. Um, could we have a question on table one? These comments are great, but um, just for the sake of time, can we, can we keep them as, as tight as possible? Thanks. Okay. Nigel, first of all, Murray Burton, um, unattached. Um, I was the solicitor to the Commission of Inquiry, in fact, so I declare a sort of interest. Um, Nigel, congratulations on your magnum opus and its um, extensive research. I haven't actually seen it yet, but uh, the photograph is indeed of me, just in case you didn't know. Yeah. Um, I scribbled down a few points, um, two of which at least have been covered by the previous speaker. On the five-shot suicide, it's the question um, I get asked probably two or three times a month still to this day. It is indeed possible to shoot yourself more than once. Five-shot suicide is not impossible. McClellan's weapon, which I fired into that famous block, low velocity, had no recoil at all, as they say, deliberately issued so you don't blow people away in the street. Um, even in the days without the internet, I found 12 case precedents of multiple shot suicides, so it's not impossible. Um, secondly, again, as this previous speaker mentioned, uh, police protocol was breached. Jack Trotman, 
McLaren's boss, divisional superintendent, a very, very kind man, uh, told McClellan the night before that he was going to be arrested by the SIU the following morning. Uh, he consulted Stephen Llewellyn, a solicitor, and told Llewellyn all about his uh, mythology and what he did with local Chinese boys. Um, Llewellyn's client privilege on that was waived by the family because the family wanted to know what happened. At the, at the inquiry, so the tale was told. Um, the suicide note next was not challenged in any way by any of 14 council present. We got a graphologist out from the UK, an expert witness in handwriting, the suicide note not challenged by anybody on any account. Um, I was going to have interviewed an antique dealer called Ian McLean uh, the morning after uh, sorry, the morning after he was found dead, murdered in his flat in Central. My own little conspiracy theory as to what he might have been going to tell me. Uh, I think it was all to do with an enlargement on what the gay community were being subjected to at the time. And finally, on police policy, um, so T.L. Yang had in chambers a discussion with council as to whether it was relevant to discuss the allegations of homosexuality against the then Commissioner of Police, Roy Henry. He decided it was not relevant. Um, I found that a little bit surprising, uh, since he was the Commissioner of Police, and police policy emanates therefrom and others. Uh, the Assistant Commissioner of Police, Eric Blackburn, head of what was then called personnel, was brought back to the inquiry four times um, one thought he was being economical with the truth, um, but he insisted that the police force did not knowingly employ any homosexuals. Um, so that really is a few points I just thought I'd raise, not questions as such, but they've been covered by some of the previous speakers as well. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Would you like to comment on, on any of those points? Actually, can I ask a question with regard to T.L. Yang, who is still with us? Yes. Um, were you able to talk to him? Uh, has he reflected himself, do you know, on this whole case? He is very circumspect. He did have me uh, for an interview. Uh, he was charming. Um, he gave me one or two uh, interesting personal insights. But on the, the main grounds of the findings of the inquiry, and whether he was interfered with by the governor, um, he was very discreet and refused to say. Um, I, to the extent that I'm, the reason I know there was an attempt to interfere with the inquiry is that we were given um, information by the, from, I made a Freedom of Information request to actually the Foreign Office in London, and they came back with wads of paper that they'd found in their, their, their store. Uh, and that indicated quite clearly the governor had actually got Exco in Hong Kong to agree that the commission should be put in camera and should be reduced in length. Um, he was going to force the com uh, Commissioner of the Inquiry to do that, and Yang resisted. But when I spoke to Justice Yang, um, he wasn't going to say that, um, and claimed to have no knowledge, no remembrance. And I honor him for that. I, I think uh, he stuck out for almost two months against the governor, who had made this decision in Exco and had told the Foreign Office he'd been to see the Minister of State in London to tell him he was going to do it, um, and he resisted. So I, I actually rather ended up honoring Justice Yang. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Peter. Hi, uh, Peter Sargent, Standard Chartered, soon to be ex Standard Chartered. Um, I'm going to take a year off and travel, but one of the things I'm going to be doing during the course of that year is I sit on the board of a charity called Urban Light in, in Chiang Mai, as you know, Nigel. Uh, Urban Light specifically deals with young boys, and I mean young, that are trafficked into the sex industry. Um, so one of the most awful examples of modern day slavery and human trafficking. Um, my question for you um, is, um, lots been made in this book about the shooting and, and the cover up and what have you. What is this doing to open up the conversation around pedophilia and, and, and what's the role of the gay community specifically um, in calling that out and saying this, these are not our people, this is not part of our, our world and, and really tackling that difficult conversation because, because for me, that's the most important part of this book. It, it's uncovering that and, and shining a light on that and, and, and saying that that's not acceptable in any way, shape, or form. It's, it's a tricky one. I, I don't think there's much going on at the moment in Hong Kong that reflects any of it. Maybe the book might spark something. Um, at the time, uh, talking to people in the community at the time, uh, ordinary homosexual men um, knew who um, were the ones who were uh, picking up little boys and trafficking them. Uh, and they disliked it and they kept away from it. 
but, but nobody would speak out because no one could speak out about anything. Um, and the police and the government saw no distinction between the two anyway. Uh, so it was total confusion at the time, um, resulting in no investigations, no care about those children who'd been abused. Nobody bothered. Now, I don't know, Peter. I mean, it's an interesting point. Um, fingers crossed. Yeah. There's a question here. Good afternoon, Colonel. Guy Schurer, also a retired police officer. Um, two things, if I may. Um, I don't believe you followed up on an offer to uh, talk to Inspector Fulton about his involvement. And secondly, um, if you do, as I think you do, seriously believe that the whole matter of pedophilia and uh, all the rest of it in high levels of government um, was not, was covered up, uh, what do you think should have happened? What, do you, what would you like to have seen have happened at the time? Regarding Mike Fulton, it was a great sadness. I, I tried on three occasions to get Mike to, to talk to me. I'd met Mike personally before I even thought about writing about it. Mike Fulton, for those who don't know, was the person who was the police informer in, in the case, um, who gave to the Commission of Inquiry, or actually to the SIU, sorry, um, a list of 122 names of those he knew were homosexual amongst his friends and the community. Um, he was the main source that the SIU used to find people in the police force. Um, Mike's still here. I, I um, was, when I first met him at Alien in Cambridge Waters, um, Mike said he would talk to me. Um, but Mike then, I think, um, had second thoughts and responded to, did not respond to three emails. So um, I missed out, unfortunately, on a possible testimony there. And I would like one day to be able to fill in the gap there. Um, as regards what I would have liked to have happened, um, I'm not naive enough to think that in those days anything would ever have happened. Um, of course one would have liked to have seen people investigated and prosecuted. Um, but when you look at what the way that the British establishment in the United Kingdom and across the world behaved in the 70s, 80s, uh, up until the 90s, in suppressing all these kind of things, it, there was just no way that the establishment was ever going to even think it was worth bothering with, let alone doing anything about it. Um, its only interest was to save face and, and not allow scandal to come out. Uh, so I, I didn't, I wouldn't personally have, have, even at the time, have hoped anything better than that. Um, I'm a very pessimistic um, person in that night, I'm afraid. Mm. Mm. One final question from the floor. Does anybody have one more question? Nigel, Neville Cerrone. The, this question of the, of the bullets, the evidence, as you have disclosed, meant that there were five bullet penetrations into his chest. So we're not talking about bullets that fell out of the end of the muzzle of the, of, the, uh, of the gun. And as you would know, the, the bullet depends on the charge. So <laughs> though that same gun may very well have uh, not had penetrating capacity with a low charge bullet, plainly the bullets that were fired by that gun into him did have. So why, why is it being suggested that the, the gun didn't have the capacity to do what it did? The bullets in two cases went straight through the body and were found in the furniture or the walls. Um, a third bullet had gone through the body and was in his jersey, the back of the jersey. Um, the other two bullets were still in the body and they'd all been fired at point blank range. And from the pathologist's explanation, uh, none of them hit something vital that would have killed him immediately. Um, the, um, the four around the heart um, were around the heart, um, but would have allowed him to live, they reckon, for 30 seconds or more, which would have enabled him to keep pulling the trigger. And if he was determined enough, you can imagine in 30 seconds you can pull the trigger five times. The one in the abdomen was never explained. It was under his jersey and went up through the abdomen. Um, and nobody knows whether it was done beforehand or afterwards. My interpretation is that as he, as he collapsed and fell, he pulled it one last time and it went through there, but nobody really knows. So you're right in the sense that the bullets penetrated, but he didn't put it through the wrong part of the brain that would have killed him immediately. There was no enormous splurge of blood from the aorta or something like that which would have done the same thing. Um, there was enough time for him to pull the trigger five times. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, final question from me. Um, you've written this book, 
Is this the end of it? Is there anything that's come out of this that you would like to follow up on and uh, carry forward? Or Obviously, you hope this is going to be a great bestseller on uh, Bookazine's uh, <laughs> yeah. um, bestseller list, but... I, I think um, we, we've already heard today there are people who know about the case who, who I've not had the chance to meet. Um, there are one or two people I wanted to, I couldn't. I'm hoping that in, in, in the second edition we can um, fill out the story, maybe change it. Uh, I, I think history is like that. You follow the evidence as it goes. And I'm hoping that it will improve. Um, but I don't think I want to spend my life any longer on such a morbid subject. It's a sad <laughs> case. <laughs> Nigel Collett, thank you very much. I have got a lot more questions for you, but I will buy your book, as I hope everyone else will as they go out. And, uh, thank you very much. And uh, this is just a small token of appreciation for you. Thank you very much. Thank you for seeing it.